Well, uh, um, I'm in jail because you know it's, it's hard. It's hard. To, it's hard to say this out loud. It's very difficult. It's such a a, a horrible thing. I had this with my son. You know, I, what kind of man does that? What kind of father does that with his son? I, I'll answer that question for you. A cockroach. You're a cockroach. A monster. A a waste of space, yet somehow he is up for parole. Somehow he was only given an 18-year sentence. Well, thankfully, the district attorney shows up to speak at his parole hearing. Let's watch it, and I'll unpack it with all the details from his appeals through court at the end. So, Michael Wright has mentioned your DOC number is 559705. You are classified as a first felony offender. You're currently serving an 18-year sentence, uh, sentenced in St. Tammany Parish, December of 2009 for aggravated incest. You have a parole eligibility date, which is January 6, 2025. You do not earn good time, so your full term date is September 19, 2027. Is that information correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Mr. Wright, would you tell uh, the panel, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, why you're in jail, and why you think we ought to grant you an early release? Well, uh, um, I'm in jail because, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard. To, it's hard to say this out loud. It's very difficult. It's such a, a, a horrible thing. That's with my son. You know, I, what kind of man does that? What kind of father does that with his son? I, I, I've, I've lived with this for so long. It's, it, it, I'm just, I'm so, so I just regret it. Um, it's just, it, and I know it's hard for me to deal with that, but it's, I know it's been, it's been even harder for my son and he's, he's had to live with this for just as long and it's, and it's, and it's so hard on him. And I, I, I just want to let him know, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I did. All right, so just tell us why you think we ought to um, vote favorably for you today. I've spent a lot of time in here evaluating my life. It's It's been a life that's been wasted. I've had all the opportunities in the world. You know, growing up, I had a good family. I was raised right. I chose to drink and do drugs and live the wrong way. I just, I just made mistakes after mistakes, I've terrible mistakes my whole life. And I've had a lot of time to look back on that and, and just realize, you know, I don't want to live like that. I don't want to ever, ever spend another day of my life drunk or high. You know, it seems like every bad mistake I've ever made in my life was was because of that. I, you know, I had so many dreams about starting my own business. My both my both my parents started their own businesses, were successful. I always wanted to be a businessman myself, and I I never could because I was always chasing a high. And 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 I equate so much pain with that now that I would never, never touch alcohol or drugs again. And when I get out, I, I, if I'm granted parole, I'll be 53 years old when I get out. I don't have a lot of time left to, to build a, a retirement for myself, so I have to get the ground running. And I've been preparing the entire time that I've been in here. I've been learning all I can about business and real estate and construction. I've, I've gotten my college degree while, I've been, while I was in here. I got an associate's degree with an emphasis in business. I have a, a VOTEC degree 
and, and building technology. Um, I've got, I've recently got my OSHA safety card. Um, I've read countless books on how to run a construction business, how to invest in real estate. And, and, and that's really my main, my main goal. And when I get out is to build a retirement for myself. And like I said, I have to hit the ground running and I'm ready day one. I have the support from my family. I have the support from uh, my, my son, my mother, my daughter. Um, And and I, and I I have the ability and the capability to to be successful. And okay. I know that once I once I do achieve freedom and I'm on the street, that I I will I will never come back to jail. All right, all right. Thank you, sir. Warden uh, Day, is there anything you could tell us about Mr. Wright? Um, as far as in here, he's he's pretty much. You know, fairly been fairly clean with disciplinary. I think his last write up was um, uh, 2000 and um, he said that 2022. But disciplinary wise, he's been pretty clean. Um, especially here recently, um, and he's taken some programs. Thank you. So. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we'll hear now from, uh, we'd like to hear from those who wish to speak. First, we'd like to hear from Ms. Burke. Good. I want to be unmuted. I hope I did that right. I, I want to be. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. We can. Thank you. I'm in the dark. We've got a bad storm going on. So I hope I don't lose my phone. I just wanted to say that Michael's family and myself are hoping and praying that he will be coming home soon. We need him back in our lives. He's still young enough to have a good life and be a positive member of society. We hope and pray that you will give him this opportunity. Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, for sharing your, your thoughts with us. We appreciate it. Um, and we have Brandon. Brandon, Mr. Kelly, would you uh, like to step up to the podium and tell us what you would like for us to do? Uh, I'm here in support of my dad. Um, we've been talking uh, now for about a year. Um, and it's been extremely healing for both of us. And you know, I agree with both of them. It's time for him to come home. I need him. My sister needs him. My brother needs him. And I'm just looking forward to the future. You know, we I've had to live almost two decades without a father and this huge boy, you know, in my life. My sister has had to live with it her entire life. She was just a baby it's, since prison. And um, we're just ready, ready to have our father back. Well, thank you for being here today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now we'd like to hear from the DA's office, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I would first like to start out by just saying for the record that um, Mr. Kelly, uh, was absolutely legally entitled to be here, and he is absolutely entitled to forgive anyone he wants to. But the bill of indictment in this case did not say Brandon Kelly versus Michael Wright. It said State of Louisiana versus Michael Wright. I'm here today on behalf of the St. Tammany District Attorney representing the people of the state of Louisiana. This was depravity. This conduct which you can't even dancing on the head of a pen. If we were just considering this one incident, that should be enough for this man to serve his full term day. But you cannot evaluate him simply based on this incident. What ended up leading to his uh, being with his son again when he was 14 years old was he impregnates his son's seventh grade classmate, who, by the way, this man has just, we just heard, he has the support of mother, daughter, son, 
the wife is not here. And there's a good reason for that. I don't know if y'all had the chance to read the Supreme Court opinion in this case, but it cites from testimony, and this is from Mr. Kelly. I hate bringing this up, sir, but these were your own words. Describe to the jury some of the things you saw him do with the 14-year-old wife, punching her, kicking her, just beating her, and not a hit and stop. I mean, beating her until she was just crying for him to stop, leave, picking her up, throwing her, slamming her, duct taping her, throwing her in a closet for three hours, beating her while she's duct taped. I've seen him while she was sleeping, stick a bottle of hot Tabasco inside of her. It goes on and on. If you look at his past for domestic violence, and he was slipping through the cracks of an era when law enforcement was not taking these incidents nearly as seriously as we are today, where if the victim came forward and said, I don't want to press charges, they were allowed to walk. Look at the a number of domestic violence incidents. This man likes to hit women, and apparently young women as well. When you take all of this together, ask yourself a very simple question. Can you trust this guy? Can you? Can you trust him? He says he's reformed. He says he's sorry. We saw the tears, but can you really trust him based upon his past? I know he's had a long time to think about it. But once again, we hear this excuse that this wouldn't have happened to me if I hadn't been on drugs and alcohol. That is an excuse. It is for absolutely horrible conduct. This crosses the line beyond criminality into the realm of evil when you put it all together. We vehemently oppose any early release for this offense. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, Mr. Wright. Uh, we'll start our parole interview. Your case has been assigned to me, so I'll take the lead. I do have some questions for you. Um, how long have you been in jail? Uh, coming up on 15 years. Of an 18 year sentence, right? Uh, fi fi 15 years, I believe, in October. Okay. Um, so I do see that you uh, took and completed the sex offender class. I think you finished it in 2012. Yes, ma'am. What'd you get out of that? Well, I, there were a lot of things that I didn't realize about myself. I, 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 you know, I, you, you know, you, you, you learn about justifying and blaming and, and being in denial. Um, you know, you, there are your cognitive distortions where you, you know, you, 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 you pretend that things are all right. Uh, you know, you you know, you can as a as a sex offender, you 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 tend to use your power and control people. And um, I you know, I've intimidated people. I've I had poor impulse control. These are all uh, risk factors that I've learned about. Um, also, mind altering substances. One. Um, like you said, I know it's not an excuse. There's no excuse. There's no excuse for what I did. So, so you mentioned the MAS. You took that program? Yes, ma'am, I did. What, I what other it. substance abuse uh, programs have you taken advantage of? I uh, I I did the NNA or AANA program um, as well as the uh, Living and Balance program. Good, glad to hear that. Uh, somewhere in the record, Mr. Wright, I, I, I uh, noticed, and I, I can't put my finger on it just now, but I made a note of it, that you claimed innocence. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I was, I denied this for a long time. I, I, I didn't want to admit the truth. Well, and today you, you've taken ownership today, and, and I appreciate I, I do want to uh, echo what the DA mentioned, because I, I also made notes of your history of domestic violence. I have a 1995 domestic violence conviction in California. Uh, again, two counts in 1998, I believe, also in California, maybe. 
2002, simple battery and point for P. 2006, domestic abuse battery and Cal for shoe. 2006, second degree battery and aggravated assault uh, and felony carnal knowledge. And then we have this offense, which I believe was 2007. Uh, so I, it's real concerning. I, I also noticed in the record that in, while you were in Calcasieu, there were that sheriff's office had reports of you having sex with girls as young as 12 year old, 12 years old, and you were in your 30s, I believe. So um, it's concerning to me. All that, all that's concerning, and I can't, you know, I agree with what the district attorney said. I believe that you need to serve your full term. So I don't have any other questions of you. I'll defer to my colleague. I don't have any questions. I don't have any questions, but I do have some statements from everything I just heard. You're a sexual predator and you're an extremely violent man and you have um, cornered the market on power and control. When you had that 14 year old girl who is not, well, I don't know if y'all still married, 14 years old when she's pregnant and you were punching her in the stomach and then um, Louisiana leads the nation in uh, homicide, domestic violence, homicide. So you would have fallen right into that crack. It's amazing that she lived in the baby lives. And then I read where your son said that, you know, like the DA said, you held her in a closet for three hours. So then you wanted to kill your wife and uh, get him to help bury the body. And he refused to help. So he's right, you know, when he says that this is about um, brutality and evilness. So yes, you do need to serve your full sentence. All right, Mr. Wright, uh, I'll go ahead and vote. I'll vote first. Uh, my vote today, based on the opposition, what you've heard today, your history of violence, the opposition that's been expressed by the state of Louisiana, my vote today is to deny your parole. Mr. Barra? I'm going to concur with Ms. Renata, for the same reasons. Ms. I concur for the very same reasons. All right, Mr. Wright. Continue your work. Continue making your plan. You, you do have a release date, so good luck to you, sir. Thank you. How do we unpack this? I, you know, we, I was shocked when I turned this on. I, ha I, I, I actually, I turn on the parole hearing at the exact moment the cockroach said I had sex with my son. It wasn't that I, I turned it on and found the hearing. It was just coincidentally, that was the first thing I heard. And it came at me at such a, I got so pissed. And then I had to, to listen to the hearing and listen to it again and listen to it again and take notes and then read the appeal and then read the other appeal and then go through the legislation of Louisiana just saying, how is it possible? How is it possible that all this happened? Where does the fault lay? What is going on? And at first I thought, you know, the, the, the district attorney, they're just a bunch of phonies. He shows up and he gives a mic drop. But how did he allow all this to happen? And in the research, I see that, no, he, did, he didn't allow it to happen. They, their parish, the DAs, the, they actually seem to have done a good job. And I'll go through that. You can say, well, how is it possible that he, that he was married to, to his son's classmate? He had her six months pregnant. They didn't lock him up for that <laughs> and it came down to the legislation he traveled to the state that she was from and married her and that was that's completely legal and somehow he found a loophole i don't know why they couldn't prosecute him for doing it before he got married but apparently for some reason maybe that's a deeper topic they couldn't they didn't feel they could and then the next question i have is well well, he, he went to trial. He didn't do a plea deal. The DA took him to trial. How is it that he only has 18-year sentence? And the judge gave him 18 years, 
But listen to this. The maximum he could have gotten was 20. According to Louisiana legislation, any per person convicted of aggravated incest shall not be given a sentence less than five years, no more than 20. No more than 20 years. People who write law in Louisiana actually have in writing that you can commit aggravate against your biological child and a judge cannot give you more than 20 years these are people that are writing the laws of the land what why now i will yell at the judge because there's no reason he wasn't given the maximum of 20 at what reason should he have only gotten 18 You know, the judge, I can imagine what the judge is saying. Oh, well, you know, I, I, I can't. I just don't. I don't even. And then, you know, what made this, this case nail-biting is that he appealed his sentence and he won the appeal. Now, he appealed it. It was quite interesting. But he appealed it and won because during cross-examination, they brought up witnesses that was his wife, the 15-year-old girl, and they brought up that he had they, they brought up the abuse that the DA had had mentioned. And they said, Well, you couldn't bring that up. That's that's in violation of bringing up her age, and and that was uh you know, would would you just can't bring it in. And then the Supreme, it went to the Supreme Court of Louisiana and they overturned the appeal and he had to serve his sentence. And they basically said, no, the defense actually brought it up first. They opened it up to uh, to make it even admissible. They mentioned that he, because he was saying that he was innocent. So they were saying he, he he's, he's not into boys. He's not a homosexual. See, he was married twice. And then the prosecution said, oh, yeah, you were married to a 14-year-old girl, his classmate. And and they and they objected on that, but again they won on, on the appeal. We'll go over the transcripts of, of the court. It's it's uh, I, I I mean I, I just have to say that thank God the DA was there and thank God for his mic drop. It was wonderful. And he, he said something because the moment I, I heard the son, the victim speak. It just blew my mind, and I was like, how is this going to be approached? How do people – and and the DA just said it so brilliantly. He said, he is entitled to be here and forgive anyone he wants. But the bill of indictment is, is for the state of Louisiana versus Mr. Wright, and I am representing the people of Louisiana. Then we have Miss Stapleton with her mic drop. She said, I don't have any questions, but I do want to make a statement. And she goes on to just rail into him. He is a controlling, manipulative monster. But scary, terrifying, terrifying. I don't think there's anything short of it that he is going to be let out in just a few years on his full term date, 2027, in three years. They are releasing a monster, a deviant monster, a predator. He checks every box of evil, of danger. I don't think they listed, they mentioned his risk score. I have no doubt he has a low risk score. <laughs> With their algorithm. Sanity. He's going to be walking. What do you think he's going to do? I mean, he checks every box for just sexual predator. Every single one of them.
it's madness. And the judge, the most the judge could give was two more years to the sentence, which he should have. I think most people don't know. I know I didn't know this until I started reading the laws. And it just begs to say, why is it that this is not what we're focusing on? Why is it that when a governor is elected, they don't have, I don't know how this goes. They don't, how is legislation written? The legislators go and they write it and they say, yeah, you know, you if you have possession of marijuana, um, three times over the course of a decade well we'll give you life a judge could give you life but see, if you do this to your child we don't want to judge we no a judge shouldn't give more than 20 years it, it, it's, it's it can't be possible yeah but what do we know we're just sheeple you know, we're not, we don't have PhDs. We're not, we're not, we don't have law degrees. So we don't understand. We shouldn't, don't ask questions. Don't, we shouldn't, how, we shouldn't ask questions. We shouldn't challenge our, uh, our brilliant leaders. That would be bad. So. This was the first, you know, his first appeal. And, and thank you, Richard, for pulling all this information. Um, judgment rendered December 2nd, 2010. And he appealed based on what I had mentioned. Now it was overturned. But you can see here in the final words of it. Conviction reversed, sentence vacated, and remanded for new trial. Pretty scary, huh? See, in the case, we agree with the trial's court initial findings and ruling that the evidence of the defendant's sexual assault of behavior with the female child whom he ultimately married and bore a child with is not similar to the charge misconduct in this case. Homosexual incestuous sexual intercourse with his 17-year-old biological son or admissible under. We find further that the other crime evidence has no independent relevancy besides simply showing criminal disposition. Again, so because... He, they brought it up. The prosecution brought it up. They said that's not relevant. It shouldn't. You you know we're going to overturn this because of that. Because it was uh, the evidence was impersonally introduced to attack the character of the accused. Any probated value the evidence may have is far outweighed by the danger this evidence would unfairly pre uh, prejudice defendant in the eyes of the jury, leading to render a guilty verdict because. The prior acts, rather than on the strength of the evidence of the offense for which he was charged, thus the evidence is barred by balancing tests. So can you imagine a judge, they put, they put, they put this monster on trial. They put the victims on the stand. They put the jury through. A jury finds him guilty and a judge agrees with the appeal saying that you couldn't mention that he had married and abused his his son's classmate because there was nothing illegal about it. And there's no connection. Now, thankfully, I mean, that's again, you have the legislation, then you have the judge, but then another judge in the super, more superior court in the Louisiana Supreme Court looked at it and said, no, the defense brought it in, brought it in and made it admissible. funny huh who's running who's running our our courtrooms it makes you wonder it makes you wonder they, they that judge was willing to make them go back to trial willing to put the victims back on the stand willing to do all of that why to protect a monster can't make it up this is the the language of when the appeal was reversed. 
So February 15, 2007 and February 21st, 2007, when the victim, BK, who had just turned 17, he just turned 17 um, eight days prior, um, and the defendant, BK's biological father, stayed in a hotel in Slidell, Louisiana, during Mardi Gras. Defendant and BK's mother were never married and bk defendant and bk's mother were never married and bk lived with his mother in slidell louisiana until he was 13 years old the defendant only saw bk a couple of times during these years which would have just you assume been a blessing for BK. Now around 2003, when BK was 13 years old, he became increasingly difficult at home and continuously expressed a desire to know his father. BK's mother contacted the defendant who agreed to let BK live with him in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And talking about mothers, we'll get to his cockroach mother sitting there and grandmother of the victim supporting him. I mean, that whole thing is so sick, but We'll get to that. BK lived with the defendant on a discontinuous basis from the time he was 13 until shortly after the alleged incident. In 2005, the defendant became, and this is what they're talking about. In 2005, the defendant became active with BC. Now, don't, don't confuse BC with BK. BC is the girl, a seventh grade classmate of BK. The defendant married BC in August of 2005 when she was 14 years old and six months pregnant. And again, I don't know why this was not prosecutable, but it doesn't seem that it was. BC lived with the defendant and BK. BK testified he was very fearful of his father and witnessed the defendant physically abuse BC. And this is what the prosecutor brings up in his mic drop statement. So he said, describe to the jury some of the things you saw do with BC. Punching her, kicking her, beating her, not just hit. Um, and by the way, here's this one thing about it, it, if consent is not a defense under this section. Um, so even if you said that his son consented if that, that that was never his defense you can never say that um, because it's not a defense for any uh, you know i'm just saying they mentioned that from a legal perspective his his whole defense in court was that he didn't do it that his son was crazy by the way that's pretty much his defense um and stop, I mean, beating her into, this is exactly what the DA was quoting when he spoke at the at this parole hearing, until she was crying for him to stop bleeding, picking her up, throwing her, slamming her, duct taping her, throwing her in a closet for three hours while she's duct taped. I've seen him while she was sleeping, and this is with the, the, the Tabasco sauce bottle. Good for the DA for reading this. Man, I that DI, we've never seen him before, but he was 100 out of 100. It was perfect. Further, the defendant's trial testimony revealed he had been convicted of DV on his first wife in 95 or 96. According to BK, uh, he and the defendant went to Mardi Gras in 2007. They stayed in a local hotel, did Pepsi, did... I don't know why they didn't charge him for that. You know, they should have charged him um, with everything they could have. They only took him for one charge why not for everything just to add more time to it bk's further testified i mean it could have been contributing to the delinquency of the child it could have been you know there the more things to add more time but i don't know maybe they thought that more information would confuse the jury i don't know the first night we stayed there he had me do on him and then we stayed another night and we did it twice BK testified, it was painful, but he did not fight because he was scared of the defendant and feared physical violence. BK did not inform anyone of the incident and returned to Lake Charles with the defendant. 
BK returned to home in Slidell, Louisiana on April uh, um, or May in 2007, in which time he told his mother and grandmother about the incident. You can imagine you, the, the, that mother. He eventually went to the police in July of 2007. So the mother knows about it, right? For May, June, July, and, and doesn't go to the police. But we, we're not surprised. We saw that mother or the grandmother, I should, I don't know. Monsters, enabling psychopaths. After his mother convinced him to report it, which again, I'm, I'm sure this is not even the truth in my opinion, I'm not, but uh, yeah, she convinced him, right? She didn't run off to the police, she convinced him. He testified it took his mother a few months to convince him to go to the police. Uh huh. As you can see, he's wrapped around their thumb, right? But he finally agreed because he felt it was the right thing to do and because he had brothers and sisters and he didn't want it to continue. In addition to being fearful of his, of his father, BK testified that he did not report the abuse immediately because he did not want to go through this. I don't want to be here now. I didn't want to do it then. I just want to move on. Here's the exact statement that he that he um, gives. I'm not going to read all of it. It's it's just brutal. I'll put the links in the description. Oh. I'm just it's just insane. Louisiana, Texas, Mary BC, who is, uh, uh, and here it is, on August 5th, 2005, to avoid criminal prosecution. So before trial, the state filed other crimes notice pursuant to LACE, R4, blah, 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 stating it intended to offer other crimes and evidence to demonstrate the defendant's lustful disposition to do this to children. So the state filed that they wanted to introduce this information. The notice included the facts that the defendant has committed other criminal crimes against young children, including the acts of a 14 year old. And that on August 5th, 2005, to avoid criminal prosecution by the state of Louisiana, the defendant traveled from Lake Charles, Louisiana to Texas to Mary BC, who was six months pregnant and 14 years old. So does Texas allow that with parental consent? Texas, what the F? And still, why is Louisiana not able to prosecute that? That doesn't make any sense. In Louisiana, it was not legal. It was not legal at the time. You can't retroactively get married. So this seems like a failure. Someone correct me. I don't know. I'm not a freak. I don't, I'm not a law student, but this is insane. Law student. I'm not a student of law. I am not an attorney. I'm just a man do. Defendant filed an objection to the evidence after hearing the trial court found evidence of BC's age to be inadmissible. Specifically, the trial court stated, the court feels that those in fact of those incidents that it is involvement with the female as compared to the acts involving the 17 year old son are of this disparate nature. And when balancing the probative value against the prejudicial effect, I do not find that the probative value significantly outweighs, I'm sorry, that I find that the probated value is significantly outweighed by the prejudicial effect, and I'm going to disallow the, the evidence with regards to the age of the female at the time they began their involvement and actually had a child together. What? Like, why? At trial, the defendant generally asserted BK's story was completely fabricated. This is now the father talking about his son. The defense argued, this is totally made up story for whatever reason this poor, disturbed, young person had put in his mind that this is some way that I can get back at my dad for whatever reason. The defendant portrayed BK as a difficult and disturbed youth with behavioral problems who had difficulty in school and with his parents. The defendant testified he took BK into his home to try to help Um. Yeah. On that note, by the way, and this is something the parole board missed and the DA missed. Uh, but when he said what he did wrong, he said, 
I had sex with my son. Not I sexually assaulted him. Not I just I had sex. Those were the words he used. And um, it just goes to show what in his mind he's still thinking. He he's still, and and his son clearly you could see the 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 that he did fear him tremendously, and it's in his statements and. He was terrified of him. And um, and look at this. If the, if the consequences of, I think, the state failing him, I don't know if they legally failed him, but it seems clear to me that somehow they didn't charge him. And so this is in cross-examination when they have his son on the stand. The district attorney, what did he, BK, tell you? BK's mother. So this is BK's mother on the stand. He came over, him and my mom came to my house. BK saw on the couch and told me, he said, my dad had with me. Question, did you ask him additional questions about that? Answer, all I told him was that we need to call the police. Question, what was his response? Answer, he didn't want me to call the police because he says his father gets away with everything. And he said that when he reported his father having with BC, which was his 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 schoolmate's friend, his friend from school. Um, at this point, the defendant objected and moved for a mistrial, right? So they wanted a mistrial. Um, but he didn't want to call police because his father gets away with everything. He saw that his father literally did not get prosecuted for impregnating his classmate. Anyways, I've been unpacking this for too long. I, I don't, I'm sorry if I go on too long with this stuff. I just, there's, I can go on and on and on, as you can see how many pages it is. But um, I, I think that my rage, thank you, Miss Stapleton, for being there and making the statement. Thank you, DA, for being there. As we can clearly see, you know, and what powerful words I'm here representing the state of Louisiana <laughs> and without, you know, it's, <laughs> there's so much change that needs to happen. And part of why we do this is because it, when it becomes so transparent and so clear as to how such, it seems so simple laws that are written that prohibit a judge from giving more time, that law should not exist because monsters do exist. Evil exists. Deranged, corrupt, I don't know, cockroaches exist, and we just saw it, and that cockroach is going to be walking around Louisiana in just a couple of years. Think about that. And with that, I'll let you go.